our very, very interesting program. Um, our first thing that I want to, to discuss is uh, next meeting, which is really not a meeting. It's going to be our Christmas dinner. It's going to be at the Greenhouse Cafe. I have a copy of the menu. Um, it's going to be roast turkey, baked ham, with sausage stuffing, turkey gravy and mashed potatoes, a vegetable medley, tossed salad, cranberry sauce, dinner rolls, apple and pumpkin pie, and of course, soft drinks, iced tea, and coffee. And the cost for our members is as last year, even though the price has gone up, we're going to only ask $20 a person from our members and the club will pick up the difference as we did last year. We're also going to um, have sort of like little door prize kinds of, of things that when you sign in, you'll get a number. We do need, however, help from you all to obtain door prize kinds of things. And if you have any extra little something that's neat that you don't need, Feel free to bring it. I got rid of a little electric skillet that I had been sitting around that I never used last year. <laughs> Somebody thought they, they needed it. And um, so that worked out fine. Um, the club will also try to provide some things, including some of our, our books. And it was just really a fun event last year. We're also going to try to arrange for some entertainment. Um, so please put it on your calendar the same night that we, we always have our meetings, the second Thursday, which would be the 12th uh, of December. Um, we will eat at 5.30. The doors will be open at about 5. So come and visit. And the only thing that we need is we need your money by <laughs> December the 1st. Because we, we must um, guarantee a certain number of people and we must pay for whoever we, we turn in. So, you know, please get your money to us by December the 1st. We will accept money tonight if you are so inclined. Um, it's just really a fun time. Uh, is there anything else I have forgotten about the, the dinner? I think that was it. Um, yes. Do you want Siobhan to talk about how they could pay or not? Yeah. Do you want to bring You want to do that, Siobhan? Yeah, that's fine. Uh, we're getting to be state of the art, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> you, think. you can you can give us a check. You can give us cash or. Um, you know, sometimes. We, we think that we have signed up and we've paid our membership and stuff like that. And sometimes we forget, like when you're 82 and you're someone's dad and you forget Oops. that you haven't paid your membership. Not that I'm pointing the finger at anybody, but uh, it gave us the real unique opportunity to try out Zelle, which is Z-E-L-L-E. And that's a real easy way to do bank-to-bank -bank transfers. We, we are a cashless society. Um, so you can do a Zill transfer to our email address, which Gretchen is... Info, I-N-F-O, at K-A-H-S 1959.org. Yes. And it's on our little brochure stack. And on the newsletters. And on the newsletters. <laughs> and so if you think you have paid, but you're really not sure, double check with Janet, um, and she will help you double check your list, Dad, um, or anybody else that this might ap apply to. <laughs> We're talking about membership right now. Membership, yeah. Um, uh, we also, um, and we will do it for, for the dinner or for we'll books or whatever else.
But down at the bottom of the Zelle, it has a way to, to put a memo. So if you will put down, you know, Sladek family, Christmas dinner, uh, purchase three books or or something like that. That helps a little bit with the bookkeeping. Yeah, we, so we, we would must appreciate account that. for all income. We have to know if it's dinner or if it's membership or if it's a, the sale of a book. So be sure if you're going to do anything online with this new Zelle system that you indicate what it is that you're giving us. And you just have to download the app first. Right? Well, you, you don't even have to download no. the app. It is part of your bank oh, system. Okay. Got it. And, and, it, and it has to be one of like the, the, the big banks, California Bank and Trust, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, um, Edwards Federal Credit Union is not one of them. It's CB&T, California Bank and Trust, you said that. Yeah. And yeah. U.S. Bank. Yeah, so the big banks, credit unions, I don't, I don't think any of the credit unions are doing it. Yet. Yet. But we do take cash check. <laughs> Kidneys. <laughs> I think that's all I have. Oh, there was one more thing I was going to pass on to people. If you remember at our last meeting, we talked about Roseman Elementary School. And, and I had a picture that I had been given of the old school that was built in the 1920s. Um, Byron Glennon actually went to that school and remembers the history of it and I actually trapped him the other day and got the, the straight on that. There's no part of that school left standing. Part of it was torn down after the Tatchbury earthquake and part of it was moved to another location and then has now since been taken away. So right. none of that original building is still there. Yeah, and so what we refer to as the old Roseman Elementary was built after the Tehachapi earthquake. And we are still digging up the research within that. And we will come back because this is like a true life mystery. Uh, <laughs> right. Okay. And so without any further ado, I'm going to give you just a little bit of um, some camera information. Walter is going to be doing the official camera speaking. Oops. Okay. And I'm not on. You're on your computer? I'm on my computer. Wiggle that. Wiggle that. Kick it. Kick it. Oops. <laughs> Unplug it and plug it back in. Okay. All righty. <coughs> Well, I just closed the lid. Did it flash when you played it? It, it, it just now flashed. Okay. And then you flashed. <laughs> so we've got a lot of flashers. <laughs> uh, Ta-da. Okay. So I was looking through uh, my camera and the wonderful pictures that I take because, you know, we're all photographers today and you kind of think, now, why would we want Walter here? Because, of course, I have a smartphone. And so on my smartphone is a list of the price of chain link fencing, because that is what I'm keeping track of. I have a list of how long it's going to take me to get to Ventura. I have um, a coupon. <laughs> I have uh, why Gracie's Chromebook from school isn't working. A screenshot of that. I have her Red Ribbon Week, and I took that in such great uh, resolution mm -hmm. that I still can't read it, and I still don't know what's happening for Red Ribbon Week. So I would have to rely on her to translate it. And um, 
I have a picture of a missing dog. Aww. I have a picture of something in Spanish. I don't know if I thought that was going to make me bilingual. I'm not quite sure why I did that. <laughs> and, and finally, out of all that, I had one photograph. And I realized, you know, we're taking lots of pictures, but we're not taking a lot of really good pictures. <laughs> and, and I was really surprised um, at how poorly I am using my camera. Um, and so we are so honored to have Walter here tonight. He is, if you get a chance to go online, and John Joyce is going to put some of this in the Roseman News, so if you don't have a pen and paper. Uh, the digital desert, digital-desert.com is his website. Uh, he is running the Mojave History Facebook group, which is not just Mojave itself, but the Mojave Desert. He also has a Mojave Desert group. He is part, um, he has helped create the Mojave River Valley Museum website and their Facebook group. This is a gentleman who not only is a phenomenal photographer, he is a phenomenal historian. And uh, I, I guess it kind of goes, you know, William Randolph Hearst came to him and asked him to do the pictures of the land of Little Rain. And if you are interested in this book, um, there's one for you to take a look at, but they're $40 and feel free to order them. We will get them back to you. Uh, Walter has <coughs> one large print and this one is $25. And his smaller prints are back there on the table, and they're 15. And I cannot encourage you enough to take a look at these. Uh, when William Randolph Hearst comes to ask you this, wow. you know, he didn't come to ask about my iPhone pictures. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I, I don't think he was, I don't think he'd be jazzed. Uh, Walter has just a real unique gift for being able to see how things are interconnected and yet how they're different. And you really get a chance to see this in his art um, as well as his ability for storytelling. And so without further ado, we are so honored to have him here to speak tonight. Robert. So, Walter Fell. Do I need to play with the lights some more? I mean, is this okay for you guys in the back, or shall I try to get the side ones to come on? This is fun. That's fun to me. Well, everybody I, I okay think... okay in the back? All right, that's good. And I think we're <laughs> going to try and light up his face a little bit. Does that help you at all? Try. Sure, any light helps. <laughs> well, I can try the side lights. I just want to have to turn them on. Wait a second. Let me play with the side lights. There's side lights. Yeah. Does that help? Yes. Okay. Is it too much light for everybody? Sure, I would turn it off. If you turn it off. Okay, here we go. I'll become the lighting technician one of these days. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Nice. Oh. Uh, no, his face goes dark. Uh, yeah, that's good. How about this? Yeah. There we go. Yeah. You see, he's wet. Yeah. I think that's good, Richard. Yeah, that's fine. Turn this off. Turn that one off that you just turned on. Okay. So this is better. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And then that gives John a chance to videotape Walter, and we get to see the pictures. Okay. And Ready? now he can talk? And now you get a talk. Okay, because I don't know what to say yet. I get really nervous before doing this stuff. I enjoy it, but I get really nervous doing it. And my dad always told me to start at the beginning. 
but that's really hard because I do get so nervous. So I got I got to say something else before I start get the shake out of my voice. And I usually have little jokes and stuff, but I, I can't think of any. But Facebook is amazing to me. It's come you know really come into play in the last 10, 15 years or so. And, uh, you know, you get to see, it's like looking at an ant farm of what people do. And there's these three guys I noticed on there that they were making plans to go out in the desert. And it's like, well, this is interesting. I can follow these guys. And they wanted to walk across the Mojave Desert on Mojave Road, you know, which is in the, uh, let's see if this works, around in here, and it goes over to here and then drops down to Needles, that area there. I thought, well, that'll be interesting, seeing what these three guys do. They're going to get out there and walk it. And I had heard of uh, Dennis Casimir in the <coughs> East Mojave. He did that. He said it was one of the dumbest things he ever tried. <laughs> and uh, so I thought, well, let's see what these guys do. They, they got all the modern equipment and, you know, they, all the modern stuff. And, well, they were talking, well, what we have to do is we have to plan for the trip. And one guy goes, well, why don't we do this? Each one of us bring one thing that will keep us cool, you know, while we walk through the desert. So they all get together and they're ready to leave. And they, uh, one of them's there and the other one comes up and he goes, well, what do you bring? He goes, well, I brought a nice big umbrella, oh. you know, so we can always walk in the shade while we're walking across the desert. And, yeah, that's pretty cool, you know. It's hard to buy shade out there. <laughs> And then another guy, he comes up and says, well, what would you bring to keep us cool? And he goes, I brought a gallon of water. Oh. And he's going to carry that across the whole desert. And, uh, you know, that'll keep us cool. And then the third guy, he comes up and it's like, well, boy. Said, well, what would you bring? And he goes, I brought the best thing of all. I brought a car door so when it gets hot, I can roll down the window and we'll all cool off. <laughs> 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 But anyhow, this is the Mojave the way I see it. A lot of people will disagree with me. I think it goes all the way. It, I, I include everything, any ecotone, ecotone or uh, transition zone or anything that has anything to do with the Mojave Desert. Because I find out that in the stories, the history of the Mojave, it always starts outside of the Mojave. Anyhow, I have two presentations. This one is the Mojave Desert, A to Z, Antelope Valley with Zion. <laughs> thought of that myself. <laughs> and anyhow, so what we'll do is we're going to run around with the numbers. This is number photo number one. That's why it starts with number two, right over there. And I want to show you some of the things, the differences, and some of the similarities we see in, uh, throughout the Mojave Desert. Uh, this is what, Rancho La Libre, or uh, Beals Summer Ranch headquarters. This is the spring there, oops. There, that's the spring. And that's nice, I thought I could just imagine somebody just sitting there in the afternoon, just checking that out, or in the morning, or whatever. Move a little further out, about there. And I've always thought when I see this, this is up by the Poppy Reserve, kind of, I think, southwest of there a little bit, or east. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, it's, it's just like a picnic blanket. You just you, you spread this out, and it just kind of lays there. It looks so cool, and it's just really nice. Uh, a little further over, Baldy Mesa, Thielen, Joshua Trees. How long do you think that tree is? Uh, this is the uh, Cougar Buttes, the usual granite we see. Uh, Joshua Tree National Park, there's a really good rainfall deer. The Coxcomb, this is more getting into the Colorado desert. Coxcomb Mountains and uh, Katie's Valley, which is very controversial for all the different things they think of doing out there. 
But here it's like the, you know, the, the, you get in these transition zones. This is the Colorado desert mostly. You see a little smoke tree right here. And it's like these plants are battling. And you'll see them go forward and backward as the climate changes or as the, the years go. And maybe some will win, you know, 100 feet or half a mile. Or, and I could just kind of see this, this pulsing or this tide of plants going back and forth. There's parts of the desert out by needles and uh, Highway 40, or uh, the 40 freeway. Or you could be walking in the desert and you wouldn't even know it. All of a sudden, here's this big Colorado River. Mm -hmm. But yeah. oh. my wife didn't believe the colors until I took her out there and we sat through the sunset. <laughs> we weren't making out. <laughs> Amboy crater. They have volcanoes. <clears throat> And they're so cool and they can look so cool and they can be very deadly too if you don't know what you're doing you go skipping out there through a tiny bottle bottle of water in august <laughs> the largest true mesa in california this is in the mojave preserve <clears throat> this is beautiful out there behind me is hole in the wall um, this is one of my favorite photos where are we now? Back in this way. We came across, we came down. There's Joshua Tree, the transition zone. Colorado River, Amway Crater, Mesa, and now we're up at Coyote Dry Lake, which is the bottom of what was once Lake Mannix, which was kind of a, a good sized inland <coughs> uh, sea or lake or whatever. One small part of what drained out all in maybe uh, is as quick as two weeks. And it drained down and made Acton Canyon. Here is uh, Owl Canyon, just northeast of Barstow, north, north of Barstow, about 20 miles north. And it's like the water don't even know where to go when it hits ground. <clears throat> That's what this reminded me of. <clears throat> Then we jump over now to uh, Red Rock Canyon State Park. And uh, I think it's called the Dove Springs Formation now. It used to be the Ricardo Formation. But I don't know how dirt changes and why they, the geologists do what they do. But I know one thing on this is that I spent a miserable night out there in heavy mist, almost rain. And um, and in the morning, before it dried up, the heavies, were, the colors were just so heavy and saturated, and it was like nothing I've ever seen before. And it just, the dim sunlight and the the, the wet everything there, it, it was just so saturated, and it was still the same shapes, but it was just a whole different picture from the pinnacles. Now this is kind of from the Pinnacles, it's right there, northeast of, uh, or actually kind of east of Ridgecrest. Uh, the racetrack where the rocks are moving, and nobody knew how. So now we know everything. And they figured out it was big pieces of ice that got air under them and it distributed the weight of the boulders and slithered around on the slick mud. Eureka Dunes, up there at the top of Death Valley. And uh, to me, I've seen, I see parts of this stuff all over. Everywhere I've been, I've seen parts of it everywhere else. It's like looking at a really large family. There's little bit differences. There's a lot of sameness. And it, it just kind of, I can see how they defined all this really wild and diverse land as a Mojave Desert. Uh, they say it's not really a desert at all. They say it's not even really the Mojave Desert, it's a combination. But to me, it's its own animal. Dante's view, this is a popular view in Death Valley National Park. When I went up there, one of the times I went up there, it was uh, 
There was a mobile autopsy van up there, and people were spending the night in that. And I thought that was pretty resourceful, you know. <laughs> Be out on the job checking out bodies and stuff. <laughs> and we're above, a mile above uh, sea level right here. And sea level is down there where that water is. And that's usually, that's bad water there. It's actually out here somewhere. People walk, I never walked out there, I figured, you know, I'm low enough right now. No, I mean, <clears throat> so, you know, I've, I've been all around different things. This is over in, uh, in Vegas, Las Vegas, Red Rock Canyon, the Spring Mountains over uh, its uh, National Conservation Area. And this is one of the places where the wagons would come through. They'd stop over at Mountain Springs, they'd go up over the pass, Fremont came through here, through there. That was after he came through this area. In fact, we're probably standing right on the road. And then, uh, here, they went on over from, uh, okay, Dante's View. And he went up, and up there is uh, the Virgin River, named after Thomas Virgin, or the Virgin Mary, depending on who you listen to. Uh, because the Spanish were very involved with that, well, were involved with that area. I don't know about very involved. Look, look, look. Yeah, the Virgin River. And it's come, it has it's coming out of the Virgin Gorge. <coughs> There's a fine tail. It, this river, probably about 10 miles behind me, downstream, it bends, and there's no Paiute legend talking about how they're having an argument on which animal was going to be the first people. And Rabbit wanted to do it, but Rabbit had a short temper. And they said, no, we're going to have people be people. And the Rabbit got upset, and he went to this river, and he kicked a giant boulder, and that's what diverted the river and aimed it towards the Colorado. So I always thought that was just really cool. Now, uh, whoop, <clears throat> this is Zion, which is the bus driver on the tour bus that I rode on. And I didn't ride all the way, so it's like, I don't, I like doing the exploring on foot or by myself, but a lot of people say, well, that's not even in the desert. Well, the tour bus driver said it was, so I don't know about that. Now, beyond this, this lonesome, broken-looking pine up there is not the desert, there's somewhere else I don't really care about. Why well, care? I mean, you know. It's what makes it, you know, this is the very end of what I see as our Mojave Desert. Okay. Now, the second part. Hopefully that went, mm, I'm not going to ask kind of showed you what we have in our desert, and you can see it all, it's kind of, I, I, I believe we can see how it's kind of all related to each other. It may be looking distant sometimes. You should see some of my cousins. <laughs> Anyhow, well, this is, uh, I, I get into brisket surrealism, I call it. Yeah, that's a window out of size, it's in a cloud out in the sky. But it won awards at a fair, and I use it for a nice cover. <laughs> oh, like Javon was saying, I had, I was putting my stuff online, and one day I get a call from William Randolph Hearst III, great grandson of George Hearst, the, mine, uh, the mining empire guy, grandson of uh, the Rosebud guy. But anyhow, he asked me if I'd be interested in doing this or Jedediah Smith coming across the Mojave. And I said, yes, I am. Mm -hmm. So he, we made a deal real quick, and uh, he wanted to hire one of my photos to illustrate the classic by Mary Austin. Now, Mary Austin, she lived, she wrote a book in 1903 and introduced, it was called Land of Little Rain. But she was a writer, she was born in Illinois. 
Uh, she moved, ended up moving up to Independence after she married, I think it was uh, Wallace Stafford Austin. Well, anyhow, they got up there and go the wrong way here. They had a little girl, very sweet, but she had developmental problems. Well, that, I don't know if that was it, but it ended up in to where these two started not getting along. She decided one day she was going to shoot him, and she did, <clears throat> but she didn't kill him, <laughs> which I was kind of happy to her. <laughs> Anyhow, so he ended up staying alive, and the people up in Independence, that area, they like him a lot. Uh, they, they also, they honor Mary Austin. And what this was, was this is one of the first environmental books by a woman, as well as one of the first environmental writings, I guess, you know, that started the current environmental trend from way back, you know, over 10 years ago now. And she, uh, people really liked it. It was up with John Muir and his, his uh, thing on Yosemite. She ended up leaving Independence and hanging out with the likes of uh, Jack London, Upton Sinclair, and Ambrose Pierce. Mm -hmm. Now, these are old names and famous, and I know Jack London, he did like uh, Call of the Wild. I don't know if White Fang is a different book or whatever. Um, Upton Sinclair, I know I've heard the name, I've probably seen the movie. Ambrose Beers I like though because he just kind of disappeared one day. He wrote these really cool, I remember one story he called The Hawk. And it was just about a hawk and how it ended up, I guess, dying. It was a long time ago when I read it. And I had heard that Ambrose, he just disappeared off the face of the earth. But then people started saying, well, he was with Pancho Villa down in Mexico, mm -hmm. fighting for the revolution, and he got killed. But I kind of liked it where he just disappeared. But he, you know, these guys, he was one of the ones that just kind of threw up everything and went and decided to go do what he wanted to do. Now, Land of Little Rain, it's been uh, six times that I've seen, probably even more. But the notable uh, additions of it is uh, 1950. It was a bridge and photos by Ansel Adams. 1974, uh, E. Boyd Smith. That's this one. E. Boyd Smith was a, uh, an illustrator. He did the little flower there and stuff too. Um, 1988, with an introduction by Edward Abbey, the curmudgeon of the high desert. Um, he wrote a book that he, he covered, I, I forgot what they called the book. I've never read it. But I, a lot of people tell me about it, so one day I will. Uh, Terry Tempest Williams, for I believe uh, she's a writer and she's into the environmental mode too, and that's a very popular book. But it, you know, it doesn't have any photos. There's uh, illustrations. There's some photos by Ansel Adams. I don't think uh, in Edward Abbey's book. I don't think there's any photos. But in 2014, Wine came out, and so far it's the one with the most photos. So uh, that's my claim to fame on that, is the most. <laughs> Instead of Ansel Adams, the stuff he, I mean, he did, the guy had a, a, a way to him. <clears throat> and what she does is she starts giving us the language of the Mojave. And I mean, not only, you know, what, it's how to speak of it and how if I think if the Mojave Desert were a person, maybe it would want to be betrayed. Uh, we have the legend of the Hacienda. Now you go to Wickenburg, Arizona, and you talk to, uh, they say, well, you drink this water, and you're going to lie the rest of your life. You'll never speak the truth again. So what I do is I read this sign, and I heard the story. That's why I went to Wickenburg. <laughs> and, um, so I go up to the, their visitor center in a railroad car, and there's two nice ladies in there working, and 
they have these big, huge pellets of Hacienda river water. <laughs> so, oh, okay, I'll get me, I'll get me something to take home. I had already drank out of the river, you know. And yeah, they're sitting there, they, well, is this, you know, if, you, if I drink this, will I lie forever? You know, is that a true story? And the lady goes, yes. You will lie forever. It is a true story. Well, the other lady looks at me and goes, she's lying. <laughs> so, I don't know if it worked, but I bought a couple of bottles. <clears throat> and I don't think it goes this way or that way. They came up with some story about how if you drink from below the line, you'll lie forever. If you'll drink from above the line, which is from the water tank, then you'll tell the truth forever. <laughs> But now I could be lying. Uh, Land of Little Rain, I think it's 14 chapters in the preface. If you ever read this book, if you don't get the one, which I, I totally recommend getting my version of the book. You bet. But it's worth reading anyhow. That um, if you're going to read it, though, read the preface. I never read one before in my life. But I ended up going back to this and reading the preface. And she explains why she's doing what she's doing. And uh, me and Hurst, we disagreed on that. He says she made some things up. I don't believe she did. She just called them by the name she knew them of. Now she's writing specifically, mostly about uh, the area in the Long Valley uh, where Lone Pine Independence. There was a town named Kearsarge that was caught under an avalanche, uh, Death Valley. And, you know, that's where her stories take place. But reading that, and what I did was I started taking the book out with me to read. I would camp out in the <clears> desert <throat> doing photography. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I'd read that. And it's like, well, I'm reading this, and it's, it's right there. but. You know, I'm in, you know, a different area. I'm in the East Mojave. But you start seeing the things she would describe. You see them all over. Or you can feel that. Different, uh, I love this part. And it is no use trying to improve on children's names for wildflowers. And you think of that, and that just gave me a little shiver. Which might be the sweat. Uh, I, I think of it like raindrops in a pond in all of our parts of Mojave. This is the Indian territories of uh, the, I guess, what, <coughs> prehistoric Mojave or whatever. And yeah, I've learned a lot of this from uh, Antelope Valley Indian Museum. And now here is that same area kind of divided up into uh, eco subsections or, you know, the ecologies of the different things. And you can see each one of these, when you drive through it, it's all the same. But if you look at the descriptions, you know what differences to look for. It's all the same, but it's all different. This is the area that I was talking about, the Independence to Lone Pine, Pier Sargent's here. And she talks about Opapago. Well, that was the Indian name for Mount Whitney. They didn't know Mr. Whitney. <laughs> <clears throat> so what she'd do is she would go to the earliest name she could find on things. She would use the Indian name rather than the white people's name because these were more natural to the land. Uh, yeah, she talked about here, here we are, we're back at the uh, Coyote Lake, Coyote Dry Lake. And even way out here, I got out in the middle of this thing and there's water out there. Water hole. Why? There's a hole and I have water in it. And I thought, well, that's simple. Yeah, but it's cool, there's just like, that was where life could go in the middle of this big dry lake. They talk about a strategy. This guy was trying to beg from us out in Death Valley. Well, I just pretty much stared at him until they go away. I have no problems with the feeling of the coyote, I will not give part of my bologna sandwich. <laughs> And this, she talks about Jimville in uh, the country of Lost Borders. 
And she, under, to me, it's like she understands this concept of like the, the, the circles in a pond after it's raining and how people and plants and life can grow and dissipate or they can cross or they can overlap. <clears throat> she describes things that all of a sudden, you know, it, it gives life to things that, that you wouldn't think that you can kind of see, but you, you feel like it's kind of goofy if you're not catching it. Now here, Camp Booty, one of the dumbest words I ever read, because it sounds like a freakish way of saying camp. Let's go back. And, the, well, the Camp Booty, I started, I, I was trying to look it up, I couldn't find it, I couldn't find it, it took me years. And then finally, I figured, well, let's try it with a Y instead of an I E. And then I found out, no, it's the Southwest American Indian Village. And it's like, well, that's weird. And, you know, it makes you almost, I don't know where that came from. I know the word, I'm pretty sure the word can't come from a different source. But this is the Rodman Mountains Petroglyph. Uh, petroglyphs, there's a whole bunch of canyon up in there, volcanic lava wash or whatever. Well, see, now she spells Cambodi, i.e. <coughs> Owens Lake was Bitter Lake. Owens Lake is gone, it has been for as long as she wrote the book. And uh, looking across Bitter Lake to the purple tops of the Triangle, the medicine man drew its uh, so bad. happy places one by one, like Blessed Little Islands of the Sea of Talk. Shoshone Land talks about a uh, hostage. They would trade hostages to keep peace. Well, this one hostage that the Paiute took was Shoshone, and he ended up being a great healer. But the problem with being a healer is you have to heal. And you fail three times, and they just caught you on the head and take you out of the picture. Because you're no good no more. It didn't work. So the Shoshone Land talks about this guy's life and what he expected not, or how he expected it to end. But there's little places, the smother of sand among the dunes. You know, I took this photo, I was with my granddaughter. I made her get up at 4.30 in the morning with her out of Death Valley. She likes to sleep till 2. <laughs> I don't mean AM. But anyhow, uh, we went out there. And you know, she was with me when I took pictures. A lot of the pictures in here, they have to me, they have just so many meanings. They can mean what Mary Austin meant. They can mean what when you look at it, what you want it to mean. It will bring back memories for me. There's other things I remember besides you know just that. It's kind of a weird family album, but it's one I'm very comfortable with. Twenty-seven vultures sitting on. 20, yeah, 27 vultures sitting on 27 posts. And what they're doing is they're just waiting for the day to begin. And it was on a mirage breeding September morning. And I know we've all felt that. Well, this is out on the way to the Tahoe uh, uh, winter quarters. And I thought, you know, that's it there. You know, it was like probably in September or something like that. But, um, unhappy growth of the yuccas. This lady, she said she spent like three days looking for a certain word to describe the hills around Lone Pine. And she finally came up with it. And I was amazed she came up with this word. It's called, she wanted to describe the hills, so she called them puckery. Okay. And that kind of really fit from what I've seen of the Alabama Hills. Uh, this is out west of here, and I like the little, you know, when I see this, a little trail, probably a rabbit. So I just thought, well, you know, that's one of those trails, it's going to turn gray. You know, the, the, you know, the, the plants will die in there first. Um, this is the one, Soda Lake, out by uh, Baker. You can hear me. 
Oh, oh, by Baker. We would drive by this, and I thought, boy, there's there's absolutely nothing out there. And I think it just needed movement crunching. Oh, okay. <laughs> but there, there's nothing out there. And how wonderful it would be to go out there and expose my senses to deprivation. And I went out there, and the more you see, it's Isaacs is down the road at the Desert Study Center. I spent a lot of time out there studying the desert. <laughs> Why not? It's what it's there for. But anyhow, uh, it's an old uh, health resort. And you, you get out there, and you find out, no, there's, it's not nothing out there. It's just a really big area, and you get out there, and the closer you get, the more you see, the more you see, the closer you get. And it just keeps going on and on, and until you get stuck in your own rabbit hole. Now, speaking of hole, uh, fresher work with the new open doors, hole, sweet hole, no place like hole. What do the little signs say once you get in there? But I have seen some of the most beautiful rat holes and other types of vermin and barments. This is a barn that's burned down over in uh, Morongo. But it reminded me of what she's talking about in her neighbor's field. That, you know, she wanted to put a house there or, or, she, or do something. And, you know, but it just reminded me of that. This is back uh, out on uh, Soda Lake. And it's kind of an alkali flat, some soda. Yeah, you get the taste in your mouth when the wind does blow. And you know the, the beginning of a dust stuff, which these are good. They fascinate me. I just love the way it happens. The minarets of the forest, the little, the tall trees, and the things we get. Because see, we're not just a desert. We're not a desert without the forest around us, without the edges. Because it all kind of flows into each other. And once you're in one area, all of a sudden it's like, oh, I'm not there no more. This is a uh, any water that's out there, you know we're going to turn it into a ditch and use the water. And that's what happens. This is, I believe, Bishop Creek. And that goes down to L.A. for drinking water. Uh, nursing is in the sky. There's an old house out in Sima Dome, which I took probably about 10, 12 years ago. And the... Uh, <coughs> no, I'm not going to tell that story. <coughs> Anyhow. <laughs> Um, it's still standing. Right. And here's the back cover, or the cover to land a little rain. Mary Hunter Austin, which we have to change because now Mary Austin is also uh, Freddie Mercury's girlfriend. <laughs> and she had a girlfriend, but we won't get into that whole thing. Uh, Mary Austin's house in Independence, or what she calls Tear Sarge, or Anyhow, she says, come to my door. Come to my door. This is where I live. And I'll tell you the stories. I'll, I'll, the, the, I'll tell you what is the stir in the desert. I love the way they talk. It, back then, a lot of the two was, um, well, <clears throat> it was their way of entertainment, was writing and reading letters to each other. And to me, this was, one of the is before uh, mass publication. You know they have newspapers and all this. But they, didn't, they didn't have radio. They didn't have TV. This is before all that. Right at the end of the the individualized type of writing. And I always thought that 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 period of time is so beautiful, especially the way she did it about something that I've really come to care about. And I believe she's helped me do that. Now she went and she said, "Well, come to my house." So what happens? People start coming to her house. And it got so bad that she moved. She moved to New Mexico. <laughs> and people traced her down there. It's the same thing as putting your address on the internet now. You know, in big Facebook letters, you know. Come, look. Bang on my windows. This is me and uh, Mr. Hearst. You can see we're real good friends. <laughs> I've actually talked to him three times. 
He has a, a underlings and stuff, henchmen. He's really cool. I do like him. I like his socks. <laughs> and that's probably about it. I hope that wasn't too, didn't leave you, you'll be sleeping really. <laughs> well, thank you. That's really <laughs> And I do want to open it up. I know some of you are just avid photographers, and you might have some specific questions that you'd like to ask Walter or or something that's. Are you asking them to ask me questions, or are you asking me to ask them questions? I don't know, Walter. What would you like? <laughs> I have nothing specific. <laughs> no, but if anybody had something, Fran, did you? Oh, well, I like that the Joshua tree that you had a picture of. How long do you think those grew? That what? That big Joshua tree. How old? How old? How old? Well, you know, they're not as old as people used to think they are, were. You know, I remember when I first got into this, you know, I'm walking around saying, oh, that tree's a million years old, or this or that. <laughs> but it probably, I'd say well over 100 years. Uh, you know, it has been still growing. I've been out, and that's one of a series of photos I've taken in, uh, well, I have midday, sunrise, and sunset. Uh, the sunrise and sunset are in the fall and uh, summer. Then I have one with snow all over in the winter. See, so I have been able to watch it grow a little bit. But they, they, they found they grow, up, they grow a lot faster than people used to think they did. I have a good example too. There's, uh, they call it the Kill Bill. Kill Bill Church up in High Vista and uh, it's generated from an old Quonset hut that was out there for some reason and then they built it into a now it's the Seventh Day Adventist Church and um, anyhow you can see in the photos that they've had and I have a set of all the photos uh, but you can see this Joshua tree growing as the history of this church. They had several movies done there, and you can see the, the Joshua tree, it's grown a lot faster than people initially thought. But they've done, there's been studies on that. Mm -hmm. Any more? Yes? Hi, Walter. Um, I'm wondering how long you've been photographing, doing photography in the desert, and you know, I also know from Facebook that you know a lot of history about the desert. And, you know, and reading the pages and things. Um, how long have you been so photographing and spending time? Well, I, I've, I've been, I, I set out to, I figured it would take me two years to document the desert because there wasn't much out there. Oops. <laughs> and that was? Uh, 25 years ago. <laughs> so 25 years. I've always, I, I tried it, uh, photography when I was, younger but I couldn't afford it. The digital cameras really, I had all the stuff except the camera so I bought a camera. And it changed my life. I turned into a whole different thing. And but I, uh, I remember as far back as I can remember, I loved to draw. And I drew all the way up until I was probably just about 30 years old. And then I just didn't want to do it no more. It wasn't I could never turn it into anything, but I love drawing, and I feel what that was, was thousands and thousands of drawings uh, building up on what I believe is my strength, is composition. You know, that I, I really, there, there's, to me, that's like the music, that's become the music is a composition, is I can make compositions within compositions, and I don't mean that to sound real, real heady about it, but there's, you, you can look at a lot of uh, photos and there'll be stories within the story. And one of the things I've been trying to accomplish is I'm one of the guys that, you know, well, I'm gonna sell really huge photos, and I'm gonna, you know, people are gonna have them on the wall, and I figure, well, if we're gonna do that, I want something to where every time a person goes up to that photo that they paid an insane amount for, that they will see something different. They will see a new detail. 
they will see another story, they will imagine this, they can see that. That's what I want. I want it to where when you look at the, the, my larger photographs, is that you can, you know, that they, they're not going to wear out. There is a guy, um, Galen Rowell, very famous photographer. He started a revolution with the uh, hyper-saturated photos. They call it pornography for mountaineers. And this is what I've had one of my friends call mine pornography for desert geezers. <laughs> <laughs> His is, it's very, very highly saturated, very deep colors, underexposed, but brought out. And people really love it, but they, you know, I, I started reading, well, you can't have more than a photo or two of his in your house because they're just so over to me. They're like, all of a sudden now I look at them and they're kind of, they're beautiful and they're still works of art, but they're just kind of a little bit overbearing visually. And I didn't want that. I want something where, you know, once you fall in love with one of my larger photos and you can buy them for every room, you can buy them for your neighbors, you're gonna buy them for their friends. That, but, you know, that's, that's where I try to go with this. Uh, the last few years, <coughs> I found a technique back in uh, the early 1900s uh, by a guy named Albert Kahn. And he was a very rich man, he was a banker. And he decided he was gonna document the world in only two years. So what he did was he sent these guys out, these photographers, with a three lens camera. Uh, uh, red, yellow, blue, or something like that. Red, green, blue. Anyhow, they got out there and they started going and they photographed this little French village where these girls wear these huge ribbons and the, all these cultures and these characters and stuff like that. Well, he ended up going broke. But the way they developed the photo was three prints or three negatives, red, uh, green, and blue, and then they brought them out, they were covered with potato starch to give them the look. And then they put them together. And if you've ever seen these like World War I photos in color, that's kind of the way they all came out. It's the same time period. And they had this really wonderful look. And I'm finding out there's some real good examples. There, it's kind of a kind of a chromium, older look to them but I'm trying to put my art into that and make both the, the, the composition, the subject matter, part of that, you know, to where one, you know, where they benefit each other and trying to bring that into, because the older I get, the more I don't want to be an engineering technician no more. I don't want to do a lot of the things I did anymore because it's just, it's, you know, uh, my deal is, is I want to be an artist. I always have, I always will. And thank God I met the right person to let me, help me do that, enable me and my wife Margaret over here. But that's, uh, that, you know, that's where I'm going with it. That's the things I'm trying to develop. I'm not going to stagnate. I'm not going to do factory work. I've done enough of that when I was younger, too. And, you know, see, so you only got one time to go through it. This is it for me. And, you know. and like you mentioned, he really does have a Facebook presence. And I don't know if you um, had had a chance, but if you get a chance to look at digital-desert.com and look at his storytelling and follow through with that, and look through um, the Mojave History Facebook group. It is the Mojave, it is not Mojave the town. And you really get a chance to see his pictures, to see his artwork, to see the stories and the history that he has dug up. And um, it is phenomenal. A lot, a lot of the history is what has already been written but I love illustrating it, so I put it up. Uh, I usually credit whoever the author was way back. 
I like even going back into the 1800s and finding things that people wrote back then and putting modern photos. One of the, the one of the few little complaints I got about my book or about the book is that uh, somebody <coughs> got on Amazon and said, all these photos are in color. You didn't do this, you didn't match that, and all this. And it's like, well, people saw it in color back then too. This isn't an invention that we came up with in the 50s. <laughs> <laughs> something a little bit better than that. And that this is what I wanted to bring to the book. And I think she would like it, and I think Ansel Adams would have went in. <laughs> but, you know, that's how it goes. So. Um, I am going to have a list over here if you would like to order one of his books. Um, we would like for you to prepay them or give me a name and a number and I'll track you down <laughs> before he orders them. Uh, but if you can print clearly your first name, last name, and write phone numbers that are legible, I've got old ladies' eyes. Um, I'll leave it with Margaret, and she can either uh, collect the 40 bucks from you now and write paid, or leave me a note and I will track you down. Uh, the book is back there for you to take a look at. And the smaller prints are 15, and the large one that's back there's 25. And then what we're doing 